try to uh, make this as brief as I can. So uh, I'm at a conference uh, last week, of Obesity Medicine, uh, Obesity Week, the biggest conference, and they're talking about this drug, the SGL2 inhibitors. You know, after they gave lectures about how you should eat less and move more, after they gave lectures about how you should eat fruits and vegetables and grains, all these carbohydrates, they announced the data that this drug actually improves some outcomes, some heart outcomes. And what does the drug do, this SGL2 inhibitor? It makes you pee out sugar. And uh, everybody was, you know, hooray, they're throwing up their hands, it improves outcomes, this SGL2 inhibitors, and they're great drugs. And it's a great marvel, a testament of what we can do as physicians and as physician scientists and clinicians. I politely raised my hand and I said, well, instead of peeing out sugar, why don't we just eat less sugar? And they didn't like that. <laughs> they didn't like that. And, and I said, well, no, seriously, why don't we eat a little bit more protein, a little bit more uh, uh, fat, a little bit more meat, and have less whole grains and less fruit? And instead of eating more fruit and more pilaf and more kinefe and more cake and then peeing it out, why don't we just address the root cause? And they also did not like this question. So, so let's let's talk about uh, let's talk about. I have some disclosures. If you want to hear about them, I'll, I can talk about them another time. But I want what I want you to take away from this presentation today is that obesity, diabetes, fatty liver, we see these all go into remission every day. If you ask a bariatric surgeon how long it takes fatty liver to go away, or diabetes to go away, or obesity to go away, he'll say in days. In days after surgery, the fat in the liver goes away. In days after the surgery, they take patients on diabetes off of insulin. So why is it that our surgical colleagues can take patients off of insulin and the medical colleagues, we can't do it? Can't we figure out a way to do this? Can't we figure out a way to encourage patients, properly give them guidance so that they can adjust their diets to come off of medications? So this is the crux of my practice and we see uh, issues like this go into remission every day, and it's been inspiring, and, and I'm very invigorated by what I do. So if you've tried to, what I want you to take away is if you tried to lose weight in the past, stop trying to count calories, start trying to figure out how to uh, limit your appetite. How can you become satiated? How can you become not hungry? What foods leave you not hungry? What foods make you want to eat more? Pay attention to that instead of the calories and I'll talk about a little bit how that works. So the reason why we're all confused as doctors about nutrition and the reason why we have to resort to these medications that uh, the good doctor had outlined so beautifully um, is because we really don't know what's going on, okay? One article in JAMA Internal Medicine says a ketogenic diet is terrible for you, it's unhealthy, and meanwhile, if you look, it's all vegan doctors who said that. So there's a little bit of uh, confusion because there's a lot of opinions around nutrition. Should you do vegan? Should you do keto? Should you do low calorie? It's not clear. It's not clear. And everybody has their own agenda about diet, so it's not clear in the data when you're looking at diet, which diet should I do? And it's very confusing. And just this past week, hot off the press, maybe two weeks ago, they exonerated in Annals of Internal Medicine, they said meat is healthy. We were told for the last 50 years, meat's not healthy. Now they're saying, well, wait a second, meat's not that bad. So what's going on here? Maybe some of this confusion, the fact that doctors don't know how to eat, maybe that's why you know, we can't help our patients. So uh, really, so I'm at this conference and they really have no idea. There are 3,000 researchers, they're talking about genetics, they're talking about uh, is it the food composition, is it the, uh, you know, the social factors, is it the processed food, what's going on, is it the cars, the air conditioning, they just don't know. And here's this confusing diagram from Obesity Week where they're trying to figure out what it is, they just, they have no clue. And one week they say eggs are good, and the next week they say eggs are bad, and then the next week they say eggs are good again. Who, you've probably heard it so many times, right? So they've switched back and forth, so it's very confusing, and I think they want you to be confused. So the reality is, is most doctors don't know, and the nutritionists don't know, we don't know enough about obesity, we don't know, and so we're having challenging times guiding our patients. Or maybe we know what it's like in the laboratory, but we can't translate that to your life. What am I supposed to do when I'm looking at the kunafe and I want to eat it? What do you want me to do, doctor? So we'll talk about that. 
Okay, and if you look, there's more dietitians and more obesity doctors, more fancy guys like me, and yet obesity is just going up and up and up, and there's more, there's more of us. And if you just take a second to appreciate this problem, look at how it's growing. This is the CDC map of obesity, and it just doesn't oh. stop. So this is like a wildfire, and we're watching it happen. I'm sure some of you here, if you remember four years ago, not everybody was obese, but now we all are. So what's going on? Are we asking questions? Are we being inquisitive? Is it just as easy as, you know, uh, we have food, it's too easy to get food. Maybe it is. So if you look at the, the map of obesity, it just happens to line up exactly with the map of osteoarthritis. It lines up exactly with diabetes. If you look, line it up with sleep duration, mental health, cancer, heart disease, all the maps look the same. So what's going on here? You know, are we asking ourselves as clinicians, as people, is there something we're missing that all of these are exploding on our watch? You know, and we're doing great. We're making these medications that the good doctor talked about. We're helping people as best we can, but maybe we're missing the big picture. We're making you pee out glucose and pee out sugar with drugs, but maybe we should just limit it going in. And so how do we do that? And let's, we'll talk about that. So can we find a unifying ideology that explains the diabetes? Can we find something that brings it all together? Is it the fact that now, you know, we don't have enough MyFitnessPals on our phones, you know, and we don't know the calories? Who remembers when there was no calories on the labels? Does anybody remember? Now, is there calories on every single thing? So you all know the calories of what you're eating, or you could find out quite easily, and yet knowing the calories hasn't helped stop obesity. And there's more, how many of you live near a gym? Yeah, everybody lives near a gym, right? So it's not the fact that we don't have access to exercise, right? Is it the fact that we don't have enough gastric bypasses? Maybe that's why obesity is blossoming, because we don't have enough, or maybe we don't have enough phentermine or SGL2 inhibitors. Is it, do we have a deficiency of medications? And that explains obesity. I don't think so. Is it something equally absurd, genetics? In 1950, did all our genes change where that now we became overweight, right? What happened? Why is it that in 1950, we started becoming overweight like that map showed? What happened that everybody started getting diabetes? Is there something else? Did we mutate in 1950 or did we all lose our willpower in 1950 where we all just couldn't say no to Cunefit in 1950 and beyond? Not really, right? This doesn't explain it. There's something else going on and maybe we should understand that if we're gonna understand obesity and diabetes. And you go to these conferences, and I, I was just there last week, and I wrote a very scathing article about the, the uh, status quo right now, and they're asking, is it the heat, is it the air conditioning, the video games, the cars? Maybe they're trying to find things that maybe could explain it, the advertisements. They thought that the advertisements, the kids are making people eat more, or maybe, oh, you think it is, so we'll see how you think about that in one second, okay? So, nobody talks about our food. Nobody was mentioning it. Maybe we have one lecture on processed food, one lecture on sugar-sweetened beverages like Coca-Cola and juice. Who thinks juice here is healthy? Anybody? It's not, it's not. So, but they don't really put it together, so let's figure out what they talked about. So they talked about surgery, and surgery is very effective, okay? So if you see here, surgery, a gastric bypass, you can lose about 30% of your body weight, okay? And with banding and with a sleeve, you can lose a lot of weight with surgery, okay? But then what happens after year two? For some reason everybody gains weight back. Why is that? We are cutting your stomach down to the, has anybody ever been told to eat the size of your hand or your fist? Yeah. Right, to portion control, to have yes. small portions. Yeah. We force people to have food the size of their fist, and yet why does weight gain reoccur? Okay, so we're forcing that on patients, and are we asking ourselves, why is weight gain reoccurring? And even fancy medical doctors like me can give medications like fentramine and topiramate, which can make you lose about 10% of your body weight. Even if you took the best medication, maybe the new medications that the doctor talked about are, are probably better at weight loss, like the uh, uh, Saxenda that he mentioned, or the, the GLP-1 inhibitors that he talked about from the lizard's tongue. Those are actually very good for weight loss, but even if you take some of the best weight loss medications, after one or two years, weight gain recurs. Are we all destined to gain weight? 
And it's an important question I ask my colleagues. So why does this happen? Why are we getting weight? Why are we getting weight? And if we uh, don't have time to think critically and you see a doctor who can see you for seven minutes, he'll probably say, go to the food pyramid or this plate. Have you ever seen this plate? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Did it help any of you? anybody here? No. Okay, and what do they say? More fruits, eat more fruits, eat more whole grains, lower your fat, eat lean meat, and don't forget to eat less and move more, and eat things in moderation. Is that, that, does that sound reasonable? Okay, we'll see, we'll see. <laughs> All right, so then I, I told my colleagues at this conference, well, did you see the study on raccoons? And I want you to pay attention to this because you talked about the advertisements here in the front. So the raccoons, uh, this was an interesting study in raccoons. They found raccoons in, in the, around the city, they compared them to the raccoons around the suburb, like in this area, and then out in the country. And they took those raccoons and they measured their blood for diabetes. And they measured uh, something close to the A1C, it's called a glycosic, like, like, it's basically an A1C, it's a measure of diabetes. And they found that the raccoons in the city were diabetic, and they had fatty liver and arthritis, and they were obese, they were 20 pounds. And the raccoons in this type of area, okay, they were pre-diabetic, and they were overweight, okay, and they were also, uh, uh, they had some fatty liver, but not as much. And the ones in the city, in the, in the farmlands, they had none of them, no diabetes, no fatty liver, no arthritis, no overweight, they were fine raccoons. So what's going on? And the researchers said something really, really interesting. They said it was the access to garbage. Okay, and what's in their garbage? The leftover tuna fit, right? <laughs> the leftover pilaf, the, the Kit Kats, the Milky Ways, all the Halloween candies throughout, okay? That's what they're eating. Now, do these rats and raccoons, do they understand your advertisements? No, no but yet they get obese. Do they understand, do they travel in cars? No, do they watch TV? No, do, these see, do they need to eat the size of their palms? The raccoons. So let's address things as they are. There's something in the food that's driving them to eat, and let's figure out what that is, okay? So all those things these researchers are talking about, uh, and meanwhile, you know, prescribing these medications, while they figure it out, uh, they, they uh, uh, you know, maybe we should be focusing on food composition. So I don't know if you know this meme, it's, it was a rat in the New York City subway system. Does anybody know about pizza rat? This is the third time I'm talking. So what would make a rat carry a pizza in broad daylight? He carried a pizza down the subway in front of people, okay? Has anybody seen a rat just hang out in like the broad daylight? No, they run away, they're scared for their life, okay? They're scared of you, but, what, but this rat literally carried a pizza down the steps. I want you to understand that. What, what would make an animal risk his life, right? Hunger, but he looks pretty chunky, right? So what is driving him to eat? What's driving him to eat? So let's ask that. What would make an animal endanger its life knowing that it's getting diabetes, knowing that it's getting obese, knowing that it's getting arthritis, knowing that it's getting fatty liver to continue to eat? What would drive that? So what would drive that? So just ask that. So this, uh, let's keep thinking about this for a second with other animals because it's easier to think about it on other animals than, than it is ourselves. So um, there was, you know, animals in the zoos, okay, the monkeys, they actually, the, the zookeepers stopped feeding them fruit, okay, the fruit that we all eat that's very healthy, the fruit juices and the smoothies that we eat, right? And the, you know, uh, they stopped feeding them fruit and the zookeeper said because their teeth were rotting, they were getting obese and they weren't eating other food. Okay, and they said that our modern fruit is too sweet for them, and they had to limit it. And when they limited the fruit in these monkeys, in the zoos all across, this was the Melbourne Zoo, but all across the United States, what they found was that their cavities went away. We're gonna hear about that in a little bit from one of the dentists, I think, if he's here. Uh, and their cavities went away, and their obesity went away when they limited the fruit. And the, and the zookeeper said, the fruit that is bred right now is too sugary. It's too sugary. So let's think about this. And are all fruits and vegetables created equal? Has anybody eaten a Has anybody eaten a watermelon like this with the white? Has anybody eaten a watermelon like that? That's what a wild watermelon looks like, full of fiber. 
we all know what the Monsanto one looks like right next to it, right? Look how small that strawberry is, the wild strawberry. And that's what it looks like in Costco, right? Has anybody seen a wild banana before like that full of seeds? No, so maybe not all fruit is created equal. So we should rethink this fruit juices, fruit smoothies, and uh, maybe we should rethink about this. If somebody took your cereal right now, and over the next 30 years, increased the sugar by 100% and removed 50% of the fiber in your kid's cereal, would you be unhappy? Would you guys be happy if Post and Kellogg's added 100% sugar and 50% fiber, they took it away? Well, that's what's happened to your modern strawberry. It has 100% more sugar. I'm not saying don't eat strawberries, I eat strawberries all the time, but let's get an idea of how much sugar we're taking in and what the food is doing to us. So we're gonna talk about that. I promise you I'm gonna talk about humans soon, okay? So, so only if those raccoons ate more fruits and grains. Well, we know that that may not be the case. If they counted their calories better, should the raccoon count it his calories? No, right? Should he join the gym? Did he not have enough willpower, that raccoon, or the rat, or the monkey? So do those anim animals, do they need to go to a nutritionist, a fancy medical doctor like me? Do they need bariatric surgery or medications? Is that what they need? Maybe they just need to control their appetite, right? Let's figure out what's driving their appetite. Maybe it's the food. Okay, so what I want you to take away here is there's three main concepts I'd like you to, you can apply to any diet. Okay, any diet you choose, okay, to have some good outcomes. And the first of which is remove the sugar and fat combination. Okay, and I'll talk about why that is. The sugar and fat combination. So I'm gonna talk about that first and it'll be very quick. How much time do I have? Five minutes, okay. So what we found is when we flash images, we hook up patients to functional MRIs. These are MRIs, we read what parts of your brain are lighting up, and if we show you a picture of huts or just bread, okay, a little part of your brain lights up, you're willing to pay a dollar, okay? If we show you just cheese, funny, you'll pay a dollar. If we show you, and the addiction areas of the brain don't light up, but if we show you bread and cheese, you'll pay five dollars and the addiction parts of the brain light up. So this fat and sugar, fat and carb combination is highly potent and drives most animals to eat. And that's the food reward that your brain interprets. And, and we know this because we know this that it fits other models, this carb and fat combination, this sugar and fat combination. What are the favorite foods? What are the most addictive foods? What do you think they are? Just name a food. Chocolate. Chocolate, Chocolate perfect. 50% milk fat, 50% sugar. <laughs> Keep going. French fries. French fries. It's a starch, 50% starch, 50% fat. You fry it in fat. Ice cream, perfect. 50% milk fat, 50% sugar. Are you guys seeing a pattern yet? Pizza is the number one most addictive food. The dough is carbohydrate, the sugar, is the, the, the cheese is the, the fat, and the sauce is the sugar. So it's basically 50% sugar, 50% fat. So the most potent addictive combination of food is pretty much sure sugar and fat so one of the no matter what diet you choose if you limit these combinations this is the combination that drives the squirrels to keep eating right now what are they doing right now they're gathering acorns what's an acorn 50 percent sugar 50 percent fat it's 50 percent carbohydrate 50 percent fat and have you ever seen a squirrel counting his palm, you know, looking to see if his calories are right. No, he hoards those nuts like, you know, he's a crack addict, right? So the first thing you need to know is that eat foods that are gonna make you full, and if you combine sugar and fat, like a pizza, or if you take bread and put butter on it, you'll eat a lot more of it. You take bread, you put cheese on it, you'll eat a lot more of it. If you take pilaf and you put butter on it, you'll eat a lot more of it. Ultimately, if you stick to proteins and, and meats, eggs, fish, chicken, you'll be full, you'll be sated. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap up here. All right, the second thing is, the second concept is lower your sugar and processed carbs as much as possible. We know this from all the studies on humans where we compare low carb and low fat diets. Low uh, carb diets do slightly better. And we've compared them head to head, Atkins, Ornish, Learn, all these different diets, and we see that Atkins typically does better than the other one. So uh, one advice I can give you is to lower your carbohydrate. This is a more recent study, the Diet Fit study. Uh, so if you lower your processed carb and processed sugar, like the good doctor mentioned, like the white flour that he mentioned and the sugar, you're probably better off no matter what diet you choose. 
So people say that low carb diets are boring. Does this look boring? No, no. no right? So not really too boring. Okay, and the last concept, and then I'll wrap up here, is stick to real food. There was an interesting study by, done by my colleague in uh, the NIH, Kevin Hall, where he took people and he fed them processed food. So imagine, uh, you know, like a pizza and Snickers, and he compared them the exact same calories, nutrients, right? But just real food, like, uh, you know, whole foods that are minimally processed. And he found that if you ate processed foods, you ate 600 calories more a day. So that third concept, which is a lot, you know, that's a lot of, that's, that's almost a pound a week. So uh, the last concept for you is basically uh, eat real food. So if I could just summarize, avoid foods that combine, that make you more hungry, basically the sugar and fat combination, lower your sugar and processed carbs as much as possible, like the good doctor said, stick to real food, and these three uh, kind of uh, tips can guide you no matter what diet you choose. And when your appetite is suppressed, I'd say don't eat. Don't feel like you need to snack. Don't feel like you need breakfast. That's just not true. You, you don't need to snack. You don't need to eat more to rev up your metabolism. That's been disproven. So if you need to reach out, there's my contact. Uh, but I guess we'll talk later. Okay, great.